Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 84 of the CU Insight Experience. This episode is brought to you by our friends at PSCU. As the nation's premier payments QSO, PSCU proudly supports the success of more than 1,500 credit unions. My name is Randy Smith. I am one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and it is my job on the show to have conversations with the best and the brightest of the credit union community. I get to pick their brains and see if we can't find a few nuggets that we can all learn from. My guest on today's show is Chuck Purvis. Chuck is the president and CEO of Coastal Credit Union down in North Carolina. Chuck is someone I wanted to have on the show for quite some time. I remember talking to him back uh, about being a guest at GAC, which seems like a lifetime ago, and thinking that, you know, we'd recorded an episode in person at some point while we were both traveling around credit union land. But, you know, COVID. So, we Zoomed. Uh, This was a fun conversation. I've gotten to know Chuck more over the past few months and knew he had some great things going on at Coastal. As you'll hear in this episode, Chuck is truly one of the innovators in our movement. He shared so much on what he believes credit unions need to do, not only today, but in the future to stay relevant. And I would say also to grow and prosper in the coming years. You can see why he's on the co-op board and the board chair there. I mean, I will tell you, get ready to move quickly. Chuck will have you excited. Chuck was great to also share with us in the leadership section of the show the lessons he's picked up along the way and even a few of the setbacks in what he learned from them. He talked a lot about his team and what it took to build this this group over a a five-year period. I I greatly appreciated that. I, I found myself coming up with more questions questions than we had time to ask. So as always, we wrapped it all up with the rapid fire questions to end the show. I knew this conversation was going to be a lot of fun. I always enjoy catching up with Chuck and I think you will really enjoy it too. So without further ado, I give you my conversation with Chuck Purvis. Enjoy. Chuck, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, this should be a lot of fun. I always enjoy our conversations. So, and with this, these interesting times, we we have a lot to talk about. But first and foremost, how's everybody holding up in North Carolina? We're hanging in there. We're still in phase two. That's been postponed twice. Okay. Uh, Cases are surging. Kids are going back out to bars. Everybody's (laughs) going to the beach. But, uh, you know, the death rates have stayed pretty stable. And, uh, you know, I just saw a piece that that's occurring across the country. They're way down from where they were in March and April. So we're hanging in. I think still trying to figure out what does back to school look like. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. That is a huge one. And we have a lot of employees with kids, so it's foremost on their minds. You know, you know, Jill was just on the podcast and she was talking a lot about that because um, we've had, we've actually talked to quite a few friends who are, the families are doing the, does one parent stay home if you have to homeschool or, you know, teach from home? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a crazy thing, right? Like, so it's, it, uh, it should be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Yep. You know, one thing that I really wanted to talk to you about was, you know, over the the past few months, I've heard you talk about the things that you and your team at Coastal have been doing. How did that work that you already had in place pre-COVID, like help (laughs) you, you know what I mean? Like help you move, I I, I think, into this interesting world we live in today. Well, I'll I'll say two things that we weren't. So after I got back from the GAC, I'd been hearing about COVID and, I think that was the time cases started showing up in New York and Seattle. And I asked my team, send me the plan- pandemic plan. I want to re- review it this weekend. And I went, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is going to cut it. We had a, a disaster recovery plan, which uh, contemplated other things in a pandemic. It didn't contemplate work from home. So from that standpoint, we weren't all that well prepared. We had done two things in previous years that set us up to get through this pretty easily. First was we virtualized our desktops okay. about four years ago. And so I can get to my desktop from anywhere. If I got an internet connection using VPN, I can get to my computer. And so we've been through that for a few years. And then the second thing was our video tellers. Yeah, we don't have tellers in the branches, so I, we did not change teller service 
at all during the last four months. We've still been 7 a.m., 7 p.m., seven days a week, teller service, uh, vestibules and drive-ups, and haven't skipped a beat. That, that had to help. What's been the biggest change over the, the past few months that you've seen take place? Well, I'll, I'll kind of lay out what we went through. We went into serious, let's change the place mode in the second week of March. We made the decision that week to, we had 450 employees working from our headquarters. Yeah. And suddenly what happens is someone gets infected. We have to send them all home. Yeah. And so March was about reconfiguring our workforce. In two weeks, we those employees that didn't have a laptop, we got them um, Chromebooks, got them set up in, at home. And literally within two weeks, we moved 350 employees to work from home. Yeah. We also moved another 80 or so to work. We closed our branch lobbies, moved another 80 or so to work in vacant offices in the branches. And so literally in the span of two and a half weeks or so, we went from 450 to 80 at our headquarters. Yeah. That to me is something that I've heard you talk about and we've had conversations about is just how agile the credit union was. Yep. You know what I mean? Well, the, the, the first thing I did, second week in March, I said, all those projects on our list, they're suspended. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more coming that need more urgent attention. And so that, uh, that allowed us to re- redirect probably... 15 people over the next several months to tackle some very big and short projects. So April was about getting our facilities and employees protected. Uh, We started ordering masks and gloves and sanitizer and wipes and so forth. And so we've been supplying employees with that throughout. Uh, they can take them home. (laughs) You got to the point you couldn't find toilet paper. Yeah. And so (laughs) we, uh, we supplied our employees with 50,000 rolls of toilet paper uh, over the course of about two and a half months. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. Hey, that's that's the important stuff that, that everybody's going to remember. Well, it is. Well, <laughs> and I, I didn't want my employee, employees out going from store to store to store, running the risk of getting infected, Absolutely. trying to find toilet paper. And then... Uh, by the 1st of April, we turned totally to what do we have to do to help our members? Yeah. We had a member assistance program that had been in place since the financial crisis, but only had three people in it. We didn't have self-serve, skip a pay online. We built that with a, a third party that we were working with. We built that in about two and a half weeks. And so April was about, <clears throat> we needed to make it easy for our members to get loan deferrals. So we rolled out. 90 days on all consumer loans and up to six months on mortgage loans using Fannie's guidelines. Yeah. Uh, we're now entering in phase two. So those who got them in April, they run out, ran out at the end of June. And so we put a second round in, in July. So if you, you have a car loan, you need another 90 days. We'll give you, you can get that online. And mortgages, Fannie Mae's authorized up up to a year. And we're doing the same with our loan portfolio. We waived a bunch of fees, but we've successfully served members throughout this pandemic. That kind of brings me to the, the next question is, how do you think this will change the way that members interact with the, the credit union going forward? Well, so <laughs> my team and I meet, Every Monday and Wednesday morning, then we do strategic planning on Tuesday afternoons every week. So I saw a a chart this morning where for the first time, the number of mobile check deposits passed the number of checks deposited at our ITMs. (laughs) Yep. And that's flipped in three. I mean, to tell you, the gap a year ago was, it was huge. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's, it's flipped. Then I don't think that's going to change. Yeah. So we've done a lot of work on some digital stuff, rolled out some stuff in two, three, four weeks at a time. But I think that's here to stay. Yeah. So uh, on the flip side of that, how do you see the like your colleagues at Coastal? What's the workforce look like? I mean, the, the way that more remote employees going forward is that here to stay as well? Or well, we're working on putting in place a video service solution. Okay. Uh, we can now do WebEx with members. If they want to use Zoom, we'll do Zoom with members. 
I'm not sure that's a long-term viable solution because we need to be, bring in forums execution and so forth. I mean, you can do everything with us, new account, new members, new accounts, new loans, new mortgages, 100% virtual. Wow. Now, that includes phone calls and yeah. you know passing documents back and forth. But you can get a mortgage from us and never have to see anybody until you show up at the closing table. Yeah. Yeah. And our mortgage business is booming. Uh, it's all virtual right now. But we need to enable our service employees to interact visually. It's a much different experience than just talking on a phone or WebEx than you actually see the person you're working with. Absolutely. And so that's the next big project in our hopper. I'm hopeful maybe early fall we'll have that in place. Oh, it's interesting you say that. I was just going to say in the past like week, I've had conversations with a couple different friends who run, whether it's on the vendor side, large sales teams and on the credit union side, you know, that kind of member facing side it, and the amount of training now that's going into like, you can't have the lunch anymore. You can't sit down across the desk from somebody. So how do you build the connection and interact? You know, yep. um, it, it's a, it's, it's, a <laughs> that, it's hard to build trust over a phone call. Yeah, absolutely. I think video can help overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, ch I'm chairman of co-op financial services board. They have a huge sales force all over the country. Credit unions don't want to see them. They don't want to travel. And amazingly, our sales pipeline is pretty robust. Isn't that something? I, it's, yeah. it's such an interesting thing to me, though, is it, it co-op's a great example of it. You know, so much of us spent so much time at conferences and, you know, quite honestly, having those conversations in the Marriott Marquis Bar or wherever oh, yeah. it happened to be, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so to, to, to change that and, and still make the connections is, is something I think for everybody that's going to be an interesting time. It's interesting. I haven't missed the travel. Yeah, I've heard that you know, multiple times too. Two days on airplanes to attend a day and a half meeting. Yep. <laughs> it's old. <laughs> like I can I can zoom this one. Yeah. I yeah. I, I actually miss airplanes a lot, but that's just <laughs> that's a whole different bird. So <laughs> it, you know, I, I was excited to ask you this because at Coastal, it seems like you even before this all happened, you were thinking forward. I you know, one of those progressive credit unions out there. Is there something that you think credit unions overall need to fundamentally change just to, to stay relevant with all the disruption that we, we see going on? Well, I think digital is here to stay. Yep. It will become the primary channel. We got two choices. We can continue to be dependent on the FISERs and the Jack Henrys and the FISs and the big uh, technology companies for our technology. And I will tell you that will not enable us to keep up. Yeah. No, I hear you there. So we've been on a path for some years to figure out how do we get away from this? So we either collaborate big or we're in trouble. Yeah. You're familiar with Constellation. Yep. 30 some million raised. We're putting more money into it and it's coming to market in 2021. We're excited about it. But we've got to collaborate as an industry to be able to innovate on those kinds of platforms. Because you're not seeing innovation out of the big players. I mean, not fast enough. I've talked to a lot of credit unions who've, you know, I mean, they're having things made almost individually to, to serve that yeah, need, oh, right? Yeah. I mean, yep. and getting it done quick. So, you know, kind of to flip it off the business side of things, you know, over the past few months, have you grown personally through this as a leader? Oh. <laughs> it's been an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, and I've told this to a couple of to a couple of audiences, we were in serious trouble after the, coming out of the financial crisis. Yeah, and that was about five years of recovery, rebuilding, fixing, strengthening. Took me about five years to get my team in place, the right team, and then it became easy. <laughs> they ran the company. Yeah, you know, we met once a week. We talked about the big stuff. I would dabble here and there, but I, quite frankly, I was getting a little bored. <laughs> yeah, I think it was on autopilot. We had become slow. We let perfection get in the way of fast, but I had it made. Yeah, I'm flying all over the country, going to conferences, going to co-op board meetings, on and so forth. And it's like, okay, this is, this is good. 
but quite frankly, I was getting bored. Yeah. And I have been totally re-energized and re-engaged through this whole thing. I'm actually having fun as as crazy as that might sound. I understand that, my friend, completely. So <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the idea guy. I'm not the execution guy. And my team has and I'm impatient and I've become real impatient over the last four months. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about a project back in late March, and this was about self-service skip pays and digital. And so we had a team that had been studying it, and it, they had a vendor that could code it. They already had a piece of code re- available that we could modify. And I get the standard, well, we got to do the business case, and we have to uh, do a project plan. We got to test, test, test. We can't take shortcuts. And I said, so what does that mean? And they said, Two, three months. This was on a Monday. So I listened and I listened. And at the end of it, I said, you have till next Friday. <laughs> Guess what? It got delivered it next Friday. <laughs> it got done. Gosh, you've heard so many stories of that, right? Like over the past few yeah. months. I think it really changes the where it's like, okay, that's something we can do next year into how are we going to get this done in the next week or two? Right. So, yeah. and we can do it. I yeah. mean, we found, we just recently found and put in an online appointment system where members can schedule an appointment with one of our account or relationship managers. We did it in a month. Yeah. In the past, yeah. that would have normally taken six to 12 months. Yeah. And that's something that I'm sure will be there to stay. We've, Talked a lot, a lot about that before. Hey, the last question I have for you in this first section, if we were to sit down a year from now, I know the crystal ball is a little uh, foggy for most of us at this time, but what are you most proud of that you and your, your team at Coastal have accomplished over the next year? We kept our employees safe and we rolled out a number of new digital service capabilities to our members. We're going to roll out our first version of Constellation in February. I sent an email to my team about 10 days ago, and I said, here's, here's 10 ideas I have for micro apps. Simple, may only answer one question, but it's often a question hard to get to. Yep. One of them was contact the CEO. It's on my list. That's on yours. <laughs> I, I mean, members can find me if they hunt and peck and try enough. Why make it so hard? So I sent them my list of 10, and each of their list of 10 is due this Friday. So we're going to have, we're actually going to have 80 ideas on quick stuff we can put in Constellation. And my goal is that we roll out much of that when we go live with it in February. That's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. That is exciting to me. You know, lending's come back, consumer lending, uh, God, it fell off a cliff in March and April down about 50%. That's back. I'd say we're down 10 to 20% year over year now, which is okay. Mortgages through the roof. Our monthly volumes that today are double what they were a year ago. That's a something. Yeah. But it, it's about keeping employees safe and keeping our members well served. Absolutely. So on to the, the second part of the show, the leadership section. Uh, you know, first question, what inspired you to take the gig as uh, president and CEO of Coastal Credit <laughs> Union? <laughs> um, so I went to U.S. Central. And so I've been in Credit Union since 81. Yeah. Uh, I was an exec with the North Carolina League and Corporate for 11 years got persuaded to go to U.S. Central as a senior exec, knowing that the CEO was going to retire in four years. And I was the only credit union guy person on the senior management team. Okay. They all came from the bond business and the finance business, so on and so forth. And I knew credit, which was a valuable combination. That, And so anyway, he left, did a search. I was one of two finalists, uh, didn't get it which was okay. I wasn't but 38 at the time. Plenty of folks, particularly the finance people and the the investment people, they didn't think I would know how to run a $35 billion investment institution. So anyway, it was a learning experience. I was acting CEO for a year, but at the end of that year, I realized I could do it. I, I didn't have to be the technocrat guru. It's just about good leadership and picking good people. And then we de- we decided to leave Kansas City, move back home to North Carolina. Okay. 
came to Coastal, again, senior exec. And when the, cri- the financial crisis hit, the board executive committee asked me, promoted me to EVP, said, Larry, he's retiring in two years. He's going to do the external stuff. You're running a company. And so I rolled up my sleeves and we got the place turned around. And at the end of two years, they said, you're CEO now. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the timing was right. Experience matters. I'll tell you, having gone through the aftermath of the financial crisis and learning from that and making changes based on that positioned us far better for the current environment. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, we have loan portfolios a lot healthier. We're much better positioned resource-wise to deal with delinquencies and so on and so forth. But the most fun has been building this team of seven people into a amazing group that can get anything done. Yeah. There's so much there. I love to dig into. I, uh, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, just building the team. I mean, it wasn't something you did overnight. Obviously you mentioned, you know, it took about five years to get the, the those pieces in place, you know, that, um, so, I mean, that's something, I think that's a good thing for everybody to hear. We all want change quick, right? Well, so. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, I had to call a po- couple from the herd along the way. Yeah. No, one, I, one I hired, one I didn't. But either you're going to be part of the team and respect the team, or you're not. And if you're not, you're not going to be on my team. It's that simple. <laughs> so uh, that, that's going to lead into another question here shortly. Uh, <laughs> is I love asking this question. So since you became CEO, you, you got the corner office. How it, has the inspiration changed at all from before you were, you know, the buck stops with you, I guess? <laughs> I had to become a different leader. Okay. You know, with now 560 employees, I couldn't micromanage anything. And that was, I like to get my hands dirty. (laughs) I'm willing to get my hands dirty on tech projects and new products and so on and so forth. And I had to step back and say, I got to trust the people that are here. If I see them going off into the ditch, I'm going to tell them. And then they have a decision make on whether or not they're going to listen to the advice that they're going to drive in the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, I delegate everything now. You know, there are weeks that like I'm on vacation, they still meet. I trust them to make big decisions. So it's it's been a great experience for the six, for the seven of us. Yeah. And it is uh, it is a team. And we challenge each other. They challenge me. I mean, there have been times in one of our morning meetings, I'll say, well, I want to go do this. They'll meet the net, next afternoon together. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm already rethinking whether that was wise. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the next morning I said, well, I'm having second thoughts about what we talked about yesterday. And they said, yeah, we do too. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the same page now. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool check and balance. That's a good thing to have. That's for sure. So uh, the question I always ask on the podcast, speaking of the team, is there something they've heard you say so many times they can finish your sentence? Get her done. Get her done. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Why can I hear that? So, <laughs> you know, this kind of, you talked about like coming up with these ideas. One of the things, and I, I know, all of us as leaders over the past few months have probably had to do this quite a bit, but you have to make that difficult decision and, you know, bring the team along on it because you know, it's for the greater good. Is that something that you always had the ability to do, or was it something that you've kind of cultivated in yourself, you know, over the long run or. I was born with the creative gene, had it all my life, a tinker, I see things, I do things, I play around with stuff. So I was fortunate to have that, naturally i'm about constant improvement and so it's it's for me it's observation so you know that's how we got into video teller so back in the early 2000s we had done 13 branches with remote teller systems which is the pneumatic tube the tellers in a back room and i spent uh, two weeks in a couple of those branches i wasn't i wasn't a retail banking guy i was new to retail but I spent a couple of weeks in those branches. I was CIO, at, spent a couple of weeks in those branches. And I start, so everything was going through two. So the teller print a receipt, send it in triplicate to the members, sign here, keep the pink ones, send the others back. I'm like, 
why, why don't we put the re- receipt printer on the member set? Right. No, we never thought about it. And then later it was, why don't we put a signature pad out there? And then it was, why isn't there a uh, driver's license scanner out there? We had cash dispensers, these $30,000 machines sitting between two tellers that dispense the cash. They didn't trust the machines, so they would sit and recount. It was nuts. <laughs> and then they put it in tubes, sent it to the member, and I said, why don't we put the cash dispenser on the member side? And so we started those iterations. Yeah. And started making some modest improvements. It would it improved efficiency and it improved the member experience. But there were still things that had to physically pass. And so I started thinking about what's left, and can we digitize everything else is left between the member and the employee? And with our branch design partner, he and I started mapping out what has to be digitized and what has to dispense. To the member side, and what does a member need need to be able to put into a machine? And so we literally di- designed this at a restaurant one night. Went back, sketched it out, and decided to go try to build it. And lo and behold, it was successful. Yeah. So did you start with just one branch, or was it yeah. something? Yep. We we had we had it uh, a couple of years later. We had bought a new headquarters building. We Brent built what was going to be kind of our high tech trial branch in the yep. first floor. And so we started putting stuff in there that we wanted to try, put in front of members, so on and so forth. And um, so we were able to achieve, t- took some years, but now it's a hyper efficient operation. We have half as many tellers today and as many branches as we did when we started this in 2003. Okay. To back on the leadership side of things, is there something, is there a myth about leadership? What it takes to be a good leader that you would like to debunk? Mm, a myth. <laughs> I think often people think of leaders as the smartest person in the room. <laughs> That's a myth. Yep. <laughs> good good leaders, uh, if they build the right teams, they're not going to be the smartest people in the room. Surround yourself with them, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and a and smart room. Hire, hire people smarter than you are. A lot of CEOs are afraid to do that, afraid that their board will realize, oh, we got somebody better than Joe over here. I've heard the uh, the saying that you're the average of the five people you surround yourself with. So it's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Something to keep in mind. In which right? case, our, our average is pretty good. Hey, you're pretty good average there. <laughs> well, and the, the other thing is you don't want to hurt people just like you. Right. Oh, yeah from thought standpoint, right? Otherwise, you're just going to get your same perspective given back to you. That kind of leads me into one of my favorite questions. If you think back to earlier in your career, is there a mistake you made or is there one that you kind of see the, you know, those new leaders make often? I thought my model was the best. My model of leadership, my model of management and here's the rules and here are the rules we're going to play by. And I didn't listen very well. Uh, I think the biggest thing I've learned over the last 10 or 15 years is spend most of your time listening. And sometime in the back of your mind, you'll think, well, that's a stupid idea, but Hey, it's, you get them talking and you learn and, but it is about listening. And I would say the other thing, you got to be willing to be decisive. So last four months, we're not going to spend three weeks talking about something we're going to do. In most cases, we spend 20 minutes talking about it and either we're in agreement as to what we're going to do, or there's ambivalence and I make the call and I'm willing to live with the fact that a few of them may be wrong, but we don't have time to wait three or four weeks to make decisions in this environment. Okay, now there's a question I have to ask. Uh, And (laughs) this goes to your, I mean, this goes to the creative side of you. You obviously like to try and do new things. I I share that myself. One of the toughest things I've found even personally, but I've heard it from others. So I'd love to get your, your thoughts on this is sometimes, like you said, you're willing to take the, you know, the hit if you're wrong every now and then. But that idea of, uh, sometimes it's more important to figure out when to say stop. Like, 
I was wrong. We shouldn't be going down that direction. Yeah. <laughs> is that something I, I can think of many things going through my head and in, in CU Insights past where I was just held on to things too long because I thought they were going to work instead of focusing on maybe something new. So is there, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, is that something you've always been able to do? Or what advice would you give people that are just like, to quite honestly, just uh, to make sure you're focusing your energy in the right place and you're kind of cutting that maybe the the bad idea you're letting it go quickly and moving on and learning from it right well and i'm an instinctive decision maker i trust my instincts and sometimes i trust them when i haven't got all the relevant information yep and that's when and i usually figure that out pretty quickly and say oh maybe that wasn't too good of an idea after all we've had to rethink a whole bunch of our pay practices, uh, what we allow people to do from a schedule standpoint during this thing. I mean, literally monthly. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. As conditions change. And anyway, we paid all our employees throughout. Uh, but there have been times when I was ready to put a new practice in place that instinctively felt right, but I didn't have all the relevant facts. And Either I figure it out or my team will tell me, you don't quite understand this particular problem. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it goes back to the team. That's a good thing to have. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, uh, another popular question on the show. Has there been a, a piece of advice or a life lesson that you just find yourself going back to over and over throughout your career? So my first boss in credit unions was the CEO of the North Carolina League. Retired from the, I think, Air Force. He was a finance officer in the Air Force, I think. Was in Germany, met his wife in Germany, came back to the U.S., got out, and ended up running the North Carolina League. He was a, and again, I'm kind of creative and innovative. Uh, I got ideas as I'm getting exposed to credit unions. And his first response, I'd go and say, what do you think about the disc? Yeah, no, bad idea. We tried. Which, young in my career, was pretty discouraging. But what I saw, he might come back a week or two or three weeks later and said, I think you ought to pursue that. <laughs> okay. You know, it, it it took him time to get his head, head around it. Yep. And what it put in me was a willingness to reconsider things that I might have initially rejected. Yeah, that's a powerful one to learn, right? There are a lot of leaders that don't have that. Once they make the decision, it's irrefutable. Yep. I'm a weak leader if I go back and change it. Yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah, I'm with you on that too. You know, before we move on to the last part of the show, if you have a free day, nothing on the calendar, what passions do you have outside of credit unions? What does Chuck do to recharge? I'm going to be on a wake surfing boat or a jet ski <laughs> at our at, lake house. At the lake house. <laughs> at the lake house or swimming with the grandkids. Uh, that is beautiful. I know. We've, That's, uh... it, it's, it's interesting. I've been working bef before all this happened. It's about an hour and a half drive from Raleigh back through the countryside. Uh, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Great lake. But it was the one place I could check out. Yep. You know, when 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 I was in Raleigh, it's, it's on seven by twenty four. I can't turn it off at five thirty or whatever time. It doesn't mean I'm at a computer or something, but I'm thinking about the business. It was the one place I could go there and just check out for a weekend. Now I go there and work. <laughs> I was just going to say you've been working from there. So are, are you able to still turn it off on the weekend, or have you just you, you need a an RV or something now, or something? <laughs> <laughs> Funny you say that. My wife and I have been talking about buying a motorhome when I retire. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Joel and I have been talking about it right now. We we were like, maybe we get a camper van or an RV and we'll just go uh, work from that and drive around for a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of that. We've done a fair amount of international travel over the last 20 years, uh, particularly to Europe. I want to see the rest of the U.S. I've been 49 states, and I'll tell you, in most of those states, I didn't see the good stuff to see in the states. 
It was all business trips. That's that's the same thing. I only have a handful of states left myself. And that list was always like, oh, well, get the those 50 states by the time I turn 50. But I'm like, I missed a lot in all of these when I was just in a conference center or in a, right. you know, <laughs> exactly. I mean, so, <laughs> yeah, we've been having, I've seen more of the Northeast in the last two and a half months than I had uh, in my entire lifetime before. We just keep taking weekend road trips. So oh, it's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so last part of the show, I, I want to respect your time here. The the rapid fire questions, the, the questions are rapid. Your answers don't have to be. <laughs> <laughs> what was Chuck like in high school? And do you remember the first time you got in memorable trouble? I was shy and nerdy. Okay. I had to start wearing glasses in the first grade. Nerdy glasses. I was, I, I was cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> first time I really got in trouble. I had a paper route probably in the fifth or sixth grade and the newspaper dumped about five different routes at one corner. So everybody who had those routes had to come there and pick them up, put them in a bag and then go deliver them. So they were all my friends. So every morning we'd meet on this corner, hang out for a few minutes and and go. Well, (laughs) one of the kids uh, stole his brother's Volkswagen Beetle <laughs> one morning. I think he might have been 12 or 13. <laughs> he shows up and said, let's go for a ride. So we all hopped in and he he rolled it over oh, in the neighborhood. <laughs> in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was... Yeah, that was probably the biggest. I wasn't a troublemaker. The, the folks weren't happy with you on that one, I'm sure, <laughs> to find out you were in the yeah, car. Yeah, I was, I was always hanging out on a basketball court or a baseball field or doing that stuff. You, you brought back a memory to me when you brought up the paper route. I think I was in fourth or fifth grade and had a paper out. And the one day it was raining and I decided just to ditch all the papers behind a, <laughs> and, and not deliver them. People people knew when they didn't get their papers. I, I remember getting in trouble for that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> you heard about it when you went to collect. I, I think I heard about it by the time I got home and said that I delivered <laughs> them all. So. <laughs> uh, Ooh, funny. Uh, so most of us stumbled into into a career in credit unions in one way or another. What did you want to be when you were younger growing up? Architect. Architect. Okay. Yep. So is that why you enjoy the uh, the branch innovation and working with the, <laughs> you, you mentioned your yeah, partner. I, and, <laughs> yeah, I think it comes from the same, kind of the same gift I have. Yeah. But I was, un, I was unemployed when I, I went to a friend of mine's father designed patio furniture out, out of treated wood back in the, this would have been the mid seventies just for his own house. Okay. Chairs and table and, you know, side tables, all this, that tree fine building a shop behind his house. And he was in the insurance business and he keep, kept having people come over and say, well, I want some of that. He built that for me. And so it got to the point he couldn't keep up with the volume. So he found a, a 10,000 square foot building in a floodplain. He could rent $300 a month. <laughs> and set up a shop. Uh, I went to work there. His son and I were best friends. Uh, we started working there our junior year in college. Okay. And yeah, it was fun. I, I liked building stuff, figuring out how to make it more efficient, so on and so forth. And at one point, we were selling at the hotels all the way up and down the East Coast. Okay. Oh, yeah. We, we'd have a tractor trailer truck show up at the plant just about every day during the week loaded with furniture headed to florida and myrtle beach all over the place and then the recession hit in 91 and the business just collapsed and so i filed for unemployment went and met with them started looking and a woman called me one day and said i think i may have a job that interests you because she knew i was kind of a finance geek as well and it was a financial planning consultant with the north carolina league okay <laughs> I, I went for an interview with the VP that was hiring, thought it went well and didn't hear anything for three months. And so I was getting ready to go back to school to get my MBA uh, and work second shift loading trucks. That's <laughs> what happens in a recession. You got to yep. figure out how to make do. So anyway, I called him one day and said, look, I don't, I don't know if the job's still open or not. I'm still interested. If it's not, let me know. I'm going back to school, got another thing lined up. <laughs> 
He calls me the next morning at seven o'clock in the morning. Said, I got your message. Can you be here at eight? <laughs> and at nine o'clock, I had a job. You had a job. <laughs> <laughs> so that, was, that, was, that, that was my start to credit unions, and it's been a hell of a ride. Ever said, oh, that's fantastic. Do, do you have any uh, daily routines that if you don't do, your day just feels off? I have to do a lot of stretching. I've got low back problems, and some of it's related to uh, hip flexibility. And so I've been on a big time stretching routine for the last five five or six months that uh walking the dog yeah. uh we have a little eight pound fur ball white <laughs> fur ball looks like a cotton ball yeah so i have i walk her a couple times a day about a half mile around our neighborhood but what's interesting it's i've been more productive working from home and i can step away more easily yeah so there, there's no set schedule I spend today will be counting this five hours on video calls today. That's pretty typical, Yep. but it's, it's easier to step away and go kick back and do something else during the middle of the day than it is when you're in an office and people are watching and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the random question, what's the best album of all time? That one you can listen to without skipping a song. Oh, Oh, I'd probably have to say one of the, uh, I'm a big time Rascal Flatts fan. Okay. And so pick any one of their albums and. You're just listening and happy. Eh? <laughs> yeah. And right, they were supposed to be at the Coastal Music Park. I think it was last week. And so that's a shot season. <laughs> no, no concerts this year. So I got, it was a great lineup and I was probably going to eight or 10 of those concerts this year but probably looking happen. looking forward to rascal flats i'm sure yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, so i'm a reader jill and i have a stack of books all over the house uh many have been recommended from people on this show is there a book that you either have gifted others or you just think everybody should read oh i don't know that i could pick one the other i don't read paper books anymore yeah so People give me books all the time. I have vendors send it, send a book to me and there's a whole stack of them in my office. I've never opened. If, if I want to read a book, I'm going to pull it off Kindle. Yep. Oh yeah. I'm a, uh, I'm... I don't know that I could pick one. It's interesting. I have not read any books in the last four months. Okay. Just keeping up on the news or I'm I mean, reading, I'm reading two or three hours a day, trying to figure out what's going on around the world, what's absolutely. happening in the financial markets, what's going on with COVID. So I'm still reading two or three hours a day. It's just not books. I've found that myself. I think I may still have either the first or second book that I've started since COVID, but I spend so much time with everything else. So yeah. as, as you've gotten older, what's become more important to you? And my favorite part of this question What's become less important? Families become much more important. Spending quality time with them. When I was at U.S. Central, I was traveling for nine years, 150 to 175 days a year. We had two kids at home, so I'd be in a limo at 5 o'clock Monday morning, get home maybe Thursday night, Friday morning, and my wife would hand me the kids and say, I'm going shopping and I'd spend all week weekend on ball fields and football fields. <laughs> but I didn't get to spend as much time with them as I would have liked to during those formative years. Now it's a heck of a lot more important. Uh, we're about, being back in North Carolina has helped a lot. Our youngest son is uh, two and a half hours away. Our oldest is about, about an hour and a half away. I bought the lake house so they would have a place they wanted to come to <laughs> to see, see the grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so love getting the family together there. You know, we're having to do it in this COVID-19 world, which yep. is a little weird, but we, we we keep it safe. What was the other half of the question? What's become less important? Things. Yep. Stuff. <laughs> trips. Yeah, we're not allowed to take those now. So <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> there, there's a question that I don't send. When you hear the word success, who is the first person that comes to mind? The first person? Uh, I'd say Elon Musk. How come? <laughs> I think he's the the next Steve Jobs. Yeah, yeah. He He sees things none of us can see. 
he to use this steve jobs he thinks bigger <laughs> yep. way bigger way bigger what he's built in tesla and i think quite frankly spacex is going to be bigger than tesla yep and now his tunnel company which <laughs> finished the tunnel under the las vegas convention center i think he's brilliant yep now i understand he's a pain in the tail to work for <laughs> but what he's doing is absolute brilliant and incredibly successful that is true. Yeah, I think that's actually the first time he's been mentioned on the show. That's uh, I, I, I like that one actually a lot. So the way he looks at problems is just unreal. Like it's at such a different it level, right? Like it is. Uh, it is. I, I think that people have mentioned Bill Gates before, but like what they're doing at the Gates Foundation, they're not looking at just like we can do a scholarship. Those are important. They're like, how do we get rid of malaria? <laughs> so you know, yeah. it's, it's something that's for sure. Well, Chuck, thank you again so much for yeah. being on the show. My, my last question for you, do you have any final asks of our uh, listeners today or final thoughts you'd like to share? Well, um, yeah. I mean, leaders, true leaders thrive in this environment. None of us saw it coming. And so none of us could say we were absolutely prepared. But this is when leaders lead awesome teams through uncharted territory. And I think we're headed into the most exciting period of innovation the world has ever seen on the backside of this. The money that's going into vaccines, there are going to be countless diseases and things that will be cured coming out of all the research that's being done. It's truly fascinating. And so I think innovation uh, is going to go through the roof. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on that, that things are changing and, quickly. And we can't sit on the sidelines. Agreed. Well, we will link to everything we talked about today in the show notes. Awesome. Uh, if people if people want to reach out to you, what's the what's the best way to get a hold of you? LinkedIn, the Twitter machine, email, what's your poison? <laughs> uh, cpurvis at coastal24.com, 24.com. We will link to that as well. Thank you again, Chuck, for being on the show. Stay healthy, my friend. Hey, you too. Thanks, Randy. Before we go, I would just like to say thank you to all of you for listening. Uh, we Once again, we could not do this without you and your support. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Uh, also, a big thank you to Chuck for taking time out of his busy schedule to share his experiences with all of us. And, and finally, a big thank you to our sponsor. PSCU. Our friends at PSCU have been a longtime partner and supporter of us at CU Insight, so please make sure to see everything they have going on to help the credit union community. Click on their links down in the show notes. One more thing, we're on all the podcast players out there. Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. We would appreciate it if you'd subscribe, maybe even leave us a five-star rating. Even a review, if you so feel so inclined, on the old Apple podcast machine. It, it helps with the visibility of the show and us to spread this credit union love. Uh, if you happen to not think we're worth the five stars, just forget that I even asked. You can reach out to me directly and uh, let me know where we can improve. Last thing... Don't forget about the CU Insight Experience podcast book list. If, if you need some stimulation for the old mind while social distancing, we've got you covered. Get your next book recommendations from the guests on our show. Thank you all again for listening. Have an amazing day and please stay healthy, friends. 